Now that we've learned about the structure and function of proteins, we're going to take it to the next level and look at membranes and the type of macromolecules that are found in biological membranes. We've talked quite a bit about soluble proteins, but working with membrane proteins really is like unlocking those secret levels in a game. It requires a whole other level of expertise. We'll do a quick review about the composition and role of membranes in cells, but really focus on the importance of fluidity for cellular function. Remember, proteins have the ability to change their structure, and that means that anything that's found in a membrane really isn't a static 2D picture that you might see in a textbook. There are different ways lipids and proteins can move within a membrane, and we'll take a look at another use of fluorescence microscopy in order to study biological membranes. These are the readings associated with the lecture, and remember the link to the textbook can be found on Quercus. This slide is probably one of the better representations of what a cell actually looks like. A lot of times you'll see images in textbooks that show something that looks like a bag where there's one membrane surrounding a bunch of blobs that maybe represent a nucleus and a couple tiny organelles. In reality, it's much more complex, and there are lots of membranes that are much more prevalent inside the cell surrounding these organelles in order to create different compartments. When you look at this cutaway, you see that there are membranes everywhere, and these are creating lots of barriers that regulate what goes in and out of the different organelles, as well as in and out of the cell itself. Organelles like the mitochondria are also super dependent on the structure of their membranes in order to produce energy while things like the lysosome is kind of like a garbage can of the cell where it breaks down other molecules and you really don't want any of its components leaking out and destroying the rest of the cell. Acting as a barrier is one of the main functions of biological membranes where they regulate what comes in and out. It's the presence of these compartments that can also increase the cellular efficiency so that processes can happen simultaneously in different parts of the cell. We've already talked a bit about how glycoproteins can act as recognition molecules, such as antibodies, but glycolipids can as well, and a glycolipid is just a lipid that has a sugar attached to it. Many membrane proteins, as well as lipids, can act as signaling molecules, and we'll look at some examples of this in the later lecture. And for most of this course so far, we've talked quite a bit about how a protein's structure is important for its function, but the same goes for biological membranes. And once you've completed BCH210, we do have other upper year courses that you can take that'll look at membrane protein structure and function, as well as signaling. But I'm sure these concepts will come up in your other courses, so do make sure you understand what's happening at the molecular level. Hopefully you did watch that short preview video that I posted where you can see that biological membranes are lipid bilayers that are two molecules thick, where multiple lipids then come together to form these sheet-like structures that are impermeable to polar or charged molecules. We've seen how the hydrophobic effect is important for protein structure formation, but lipids are also amphipathic. Remember, an amphipathic molecule has hydrophobic and hydrophilic properties, and this is what allows them to self-assemble via their hydrophobic tails while the polar groups still interact with water. In this lecture, we'll examine the structure of biological membranes in more detail, and you'll see they actually aren't these uniform static structures that you might see in an image. They do have quite a bit of asymmetry on either side of the bilayer, and we've already seen one example of this, which would be the presence of carbohydrates bound to lipids or proteins on the outside. We'll also talk about how proteins and enzymes can help maintain this asymmetry. And remember, even though membranes prevent things from getting into a cell, it's really the membrane proteins that will help regulate the transport of molecules. And membrane proteins are also important for transmitting different signals across the membrane and into the cell. This little video has a lot going on. We can see that lots of things are moving around and there are proteins found in this membrane that are helping move things from one side to the other. And in order for these proteins to carry out their function, remember they do need the ability to undergo conformational changes. So if it's an enzyme, it can be binding to substrates and creating products. 
or if it's a transporter membrane protein, it needs to bind to the molecule and ion on one side and then move it across the hydrophobic bilayer. Signaling can also involve the binding of proteins to other proteins on either side of the membrane. And this will allow us to transmit information from one side to the other without actually moving anything across that bilayer. For proteins that are in the membrane, the membrane itself needs to be fluid, okay? Meaning when we say fluidity, it means that we're allowing for these changes in structure to occur. They're not frozen in space. We'll look at the structure of lipids and cholesterol in the next lecture, and we'll see how their structure can contribute to this fluidity. So allowing for that flexibility to occur so that proteins can undergo conformational changes. Ultimately, all of these cellular processes come down to the formation of non-covalent interactions at the molecular level. So this allows for structures to bind and unbind, and this is what will allow these types of things to happen. So whether it be the rotation or the movement of molecules, like we can see in this video. You may have heard about the fluid mosaic model that was proposed in 1972 by Singer and Nicholson. And it describes the membrane as a mixture or mosaic of lipids, proteins, and carbohydrates. So all the main molecules that we're looking at in this course and states that it, they can move about within the membrane. So that would sort of be the fluid part of this model. Now, Singer and Nicholson said that things can move freely in a membrane, but what we now know based on several different experiments is that this idea is a little bit too simplistic. That is the idea that things can just move anywhere within a cell membrane. Real membranes are much more complex and it's still a widely adopted model, um, but you do have to take into account that the fluidity just isn't as free as we thought it was. We actually see that the movement of lipids and proteins in a sample of pure lipid can be quite rapid, but within actual biological membranes, it's a bit more complicated. When we talk about the composition of membranes or its mosaic nature, we see that they are actually asymmetrical within the individual leaflets, where the term leaflet describes the different sheets of the bilayer. We've already talked a bit about glycoproteins and glycolipids, so molecules that have carbohydrates attached to them, but these are generally found on the outside of cells in that extracellular leaflet. What keeps them on the outside surface is the fact that the movement of molecules across that hydrophobic core of the bilayer is energetically unfavorable. It's very hard to move these charged and polar groups across, which would be known as flip-flop diffusion, so the movement from one bilayer to the other is very slow. Remember, the attachment of sugar chains is, formed, uh, is a form of post-translational modification, and we generally usually represent them as these branch type structures, which were pink in that pre-learning video. But in addition to playing a role in cell recognition, they can also be very important for the membrane insertion of the protein, as well as its folding um, through the secretory pathway. Their attachment is all going to be mediated by enzymes that are found in the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, and then you'll generally see processing occurring by other enzymes in the Golgi. Protein enzymes also come into play in order to set up the asymmetry of lipids by moving lipids from one side of the membrane to the other. So this top image is just showing you how that flip-flop diffusion can take days for a lipid to cross, while in the bottom image, enzymes will be catalyzing the translocation of lipids from one bilayer to the other. These enzymes can provide an environment that protects those hydrophilic groups usually through non-covalent interactions between amino acid side chains and the polar head group. And this is what will move a lipid from one side to the other. Now, depending on how these enzymes move the lipids, they will have different names. So some can be ATP dependent, whereas others are ATP independent. Flipases and flopases will use ATP or energy to move the lipids across. And these will differ in their structure and their specificity. So flipases will move two different types of lipids, PE and PS, into the cytosolic leaflet, and we'll look at those uh, lipids in the next lecture, while flopases can be a bit more nonspecific and move things to the outer leaflet, so in the opposite direction. Scramblases kind of reset the asymmetry, and they are ATP independent, and will just move lipids down their concentration gradient 
so that there are equal amounts in each leaflet. It's really the expression of which of these enzymes are present that can help determine what lipids will be present in which of the two leaflets of a membrane. So it really is enzymes that are going to help set up this asymmetry and maintain this heterogeneous distribution of lipids and proteins on either side of the bilayer. We have some enzymes that use ATP hydrolysis in order to move lipids from one side to the other, whereas scramblades don't need any ATP and they just move lipids based on a concentration gradient. Enzymes will also help catalyze the addition of sugar chains to either proteins or lipids, and then these structures will generally be found on the extracellular surface of a cell. The synthesis of membrane proteins in the ER will also ensure their proper orientation, um, and we'll look at that in later lectures. So measuring the movement from one leaflet to the other is quite slow, but we can also look at how lipids and proteins move in the plane of the membrane. So really how they diffuse laterally, kind of like if you weren't practicing physical distancing and were trying to get across campus from one class to another. One technique you may have heard about is called FRAP or fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching. This involves the use of a fluorescent microscope and the labeling of a cell surface molecule like a protein or a lipid. You would then bleach or destroy the fluorescent molecule in a small region of the surface using an intense pulse of light. And then you could measure the fluorescence that recovers and comes back into that region. So if molecules are able to move around, the bleach molecules will diffuse out of that region while the unbleached molecules will move back in. And we can measure the fluorescence intensity in that particular region. On the right is just showing you a graph where we're measuring the fluorescence intensity in that region. And it's going to be high before we bleach. Once we bleach, the intensity will drop. And then over time, we will start to see the recovery of fluorescent molecules back into the bleached region. You could then calculate the rate or how fast these molecules are moving. This is just a simulation of this experiment where the laser is going to bleach out the fluorescent molecules in this region, and then we'll monitor the number of fluorescent proteins that move back into the spot. So the laser comes in and bleaches this region, and then we start to see the fluorescent molecules move back in this area. Let's just watch it again. So FRAP can show you how fast things move in the plane of the membrane, whether it be lipids or proteins, and you can quantify the rate based on the recovery of fluorescent molecules. We can see that lipids can actually move quite rapidly, about one micrometer per second, and mammalian cells could be anywhere from one to a hundred micrometers in width, so a lipid could theoretically go from one side of the cell to the other in a matter of seconds. When it comes to the movement of proteins, they are quite a bit larger than lipids, and they can also interact with other proteins on either side of the membrane. So one example would be the cytoskeleton, which is on the inside, and that can slow them down when it comes to their rate of diffusion. One other variation on the FRAP experiment is to look at a single molecule and see how it moves in the membrane. You could control the number of fluorescently labeled molecules in a variety of ways. So one way would be through gene expression, say creating a fusion protein that has that fluorescent tag on the outside. And this would allow you to get a better understanding of how things move versus just simply averaging out the results if you were to label many proteins or lipids at the cell surface. When we do this, we can see that some proteins and lipids may not move as freely as we thought they could. And sometimes they spend more time in confined regions of a membrane versus others. So lipid rafts are one example of a microdomain that can exist within a membrane. And these may have fixed compositions of proteins and lipids that play a functional role. So here's an example of a single molecule tracking experiment where a small amount of lipid is fluorescently labeled. You would then use a microscope to track where it goes within the plane of the membrane. 
So this would be looking down from the top at the surface of a cell. So your lipid may start up here in one region and spend six milliseconds uh, over here, and then move over and spend another 18 microseconds over here, and then maybe on to another region for 10 microseconds, et cetera, et cetera. So when we observe lipids only diffusing within different compartments and then hopping to different regions, this suggests that their movement really isn't as free as we initially thought, and it supports the modifications to the fluid mosaic model. So there are barriers that restrict the diffusion of lipids and proteins within a plane of a membrane, and we can observe this using single molecule tracking experiments. We know that these barriers exist because when we're looking at the diffusion of molecules, we see that sometimes they're restricted to one region, and then we see them hopping over to another. It's the presence of the cytoskeleton that acts kind of like barbed wire under the membrane, and this is what's known as the fence model. Other membrane proteins that span across both layers can act like pickets in a fence that is restricting the movement of proteins and lipids. Whenever a molecule hops from one region to another, it's kind of like they're finding a gate in the fence, or maybe even sneaking under it, moving to another compartment. Th these terms fence and picket really aren't the best way to describe it, but what I want you to appreciate is that proteins are found in the membrane and they can slow down the lateral mobility of molecules within a biological membrane. This observation is really what has led to the modification of Singer and Nicholson's fluid mosaic model where membranes really aren't as fluid as we first thought. The key take home messages for this lecture are that membranes form due to the non-covalent interactions between amphipathic lipid molecules, and that biological membranes are heterogeneous mixtures. When they're made in the cell, it's the protein enzymes that help set up this asymmetry that we see both within and across the lipid bilayer. And this is really important for cells to carry out different functions. We saw that lipids can move quite quickly in the plane of the membrane, but the, the flip-flop diffusion across the membrane is much slower. And movement in general within a membrane is really important, and this is also known as fluidity. The fluidity of the membrane is really important because proteins need to undergo conformational changes in order to carry out their functions. And even though we know that things can move about in the membrane, this movement isn't necessarily random. Life is all about how specific molecules have particular structures in order to carry out essential functions, and biological membranes may also contain microdomains that exist in order to allow for different things to occur in different parts of the cell. I want to leave you with a thinker question that goes back and builds on what you've already learned in the past few weeks. We've talked a lot about how the structure of a molecule is important for its function, and we've briefly mentioned how detergents as well as antibiotic peptides can be used to lyse a cell or disrupt that cellular membrane. So what I want you to think about is actually what's happening um, at the molecular level based on the structure of these biological membranes and those molecules. Check out the two brain break questions posted on Quarkus before moving on.